There are many times when you have two samples where you're actually going to be looking at the data being paired together. And there's uh, lots of sort of natural situations where that might happen. For instance, if you're looking at a weight loss program, you're obviously going to measure somebody's weight before they start the program, and then you're going to measure their weight afterwards. So you have two sets of data, but you'd simply subtract one from the other and, and end up with one uh, set of data. That's a very natural and sort of direct way, and now you just have your sort of normal one sample um, approach to, to finding confidence intervals or to doing hypothesis tests. Let's look at one that is seems initially like it might be the same kind of a natural type of situation and we'll process it in that way, but it's a little uh, more subtle perhaps than that. And that's in this artesian aquifer, which is just a, a groundwater that's under pressure uh, uh, scenario where we've got a column of data of the discharge out of that aquifer and then we've got a recharge, which is really an estimated recharge into that aquifer. Notice the units here, AC-FT. The FT stands for feet, but the AC stands for acres. And there's 43,560 square feet in an acre, so this is just a convenient way to try to make uh, numbers smaller for us. And so we, we really just have area times a depth. This is one acre foot is equivalent to one foot of water spread out over an entire acre. Right? So these are already large numbers in terms of acre feet and they'd be even grossly larger, four, order, four orders of magnitude at least larger, if we had this in terms of cubic feet. So this is just a way to try to get these um, in sort of a more manageable kind of, kind of way. Also note that because those are so large, um, understand that, that it's not so easy to understand how much water is penetrating the ground and then getting through various conduits within the ground to get down to the aquifer and hence why this is really an estimated recharge. And we hope that uh, for the most part that the amount of water going into the aquifer is greater than. So this recharge minus the discharge is our difference over here and we hope for that to be a positive number in terms of if we want to start thinking about using this for units of a water supply. Right, now you'll see over here on the, the right a scatter plot of the estimated recharge versus the measure, measured, measured discharge and note that we have a fairly strong linear trend. In fact, the sample correlation coefficient between those is on the order of about 0.9, so a very strong linear relationship between those two. And that will influence how we end up thinking about the, um, the results here of, of the, the question is there evidence to support the claim that this aquifer supply is decreasing at the 5% significance level? Because if you go down and take a look at the summary statistics that we have, you'll note that our average difference is a 41 acre foot decreasing supply out of our, right, we're withdrawing 41 more acre feet per year on average from the aquifer then is being replenished. And that is, is clearly a concern to a lot of folks. Uh, certainly environmentalists would be concerned, but if you're a water supply manager for a municipality, you're going to be concerned potentially about that, or are you? And that's a part of what this is all about. Is this a statistically significant uh, decrease that we're seeing here? And does what does it say about potential usage in the future? So I'm actually going to go, instead of do the confidence interval first, I'm going to do the, the hypothesis test first. And we're going to focus in on our null hypothesis being that the difference is going to be zero and that our alternative hypothesis is that it's less than zero. Rather than a two-sided, I'm going to focus on just these negative values since uh, that's where I would start to get uh, concerned and, and maybe the data is suggesting that we might have something like that. Right? Or, you know, again you go back and say, or is it really? Right? So the, the statistic that we're going to look at is once again our T distribution and that would be our 
average difference minus, of course, it's the null value, which is 0 in this case, divided by SD divided by square root of n. Right, so that would be negative 41 divided by 908 divided by square root of 17 for 17 years worth of data. And we get minus 0 0.186. Now that's a pretty small number, even though it's negative there. And our t value at the 5% one sided significance level, 16 degrees of freedom, and minus 1 now, because we just have 17 data points that we're looking at. Yeah, we have 34 pooled, but we're already using them once to get to one single value there. So this is just 17 minus 1. And that number is 1.746. Okay, of course we really care about the negative value here. And that's um, clearly that, that if you go and take a look at the p-value associated with a t-naught value of minus 0.186, one-sided is about 0 0.43. And compared to the 5%, what that's telling us is that we cannot reject H naught at the 5% level. And of course that actually makes a lot of sense when you look at how much, how large the standard deviation is in our 17 years. That's what's driving this problem. It's not that N is equal to 17. Sure, it would be great to have 34 years of data, twice as much, or even four times as much at 68 years. That'd be great. That would certainly help. However, our standard deviation is the real driver here. It's enormous compared to the mean. So this is actually a, a, from the basis of what we see here, um, and really from the basis of what we see from the hypothesis test, also from purely what we see just in comparing the mean and the standard deviation, you got to say standard deviation of being negative 41 doesn't really suggest anything all that strongly to us. right? And then if we wanted to go look at a confidence interval, we're going to process that, process that in the same kind of manner. Right? The 95% one-sided t-value of interest for 16 degrees of freedom, right? this is going to be a different value than what we had up here. Sorry, what am I saying? <laughs> Sorry, I got ahead of myself there. It's, this was one-sided up here. This is also one-sided um, as well. So it's the same, of course, 1.746. I was thinking about the two-sided uh, confidence interval. Sorry about that. And so x bar, um, and I'm going to add this time plus t s over square root of n because I'm interested in that upper bound limit of this one-sided and you plug in your numbers and it's of course enormous and that's 343 or so, 0 0.5 maybe. Okay, And so that again tells you that, that gee there's a very large chance that um, our difference here that we're seeing is not a big deal. That we, we don't have any strong evidence at all. In fact, there, there's nothing here that says that we can uh, say that there's a, a significant claim to be made that we are withdrawing out of this this particular aquifer. And given the scale, the variability, that, that this number alone could be explained entirely just by the, the large variability that we have. Right, now, there are other situations where you might be using paired data where um, this is not a, a nearly as easy kind of thing to, to do. For instance, uh, the textbook in one of their exercises talks about um, a, a tire study that was being done where you have two different tires and you'd like to know which one is uh, performs better. Now you could devise a standardized test to calculate the, the tire wear and then get the data in which case then you don't need to do paired data at all. However, as we all know, things that are done in a standardized test don't necessarily mimic real-world behavior. That's a classic example of that is EPA estimated fuel mileage. And so those studies are, are very good for comparing between vehicles 
under the test conditions, but few people ever drive in exactly those test conditions. And the same thing could be said about tire wear, that, that few people are going to drive in the manner that is reflected uh, in the, the test conditions. So an alternative is to actually put on one side of the car one brand of tires and on the other side the other brand, say on the rear axle. And then that way you, you have the same kind of driving characteristics, driver and driving, um, as in how the car is driven and over what surfaces, are going to be pretty much the same for those two rear tires. I wouldn't necessarily do that in the front tires because of how you turn the tire and that sort of thing. Um, and, and, and that could have an influence by you, especially with front wheel drive cars the way they are, uh, are today. That could be a, a contributing factor. But at least you could do that over multiple different car platforms. And now you, you can pair the data between, say, the left tire and the, the right tire, and you can have some kind of uh, better idea, more real-world kind of idea about how those tires are really going to perform and then you can make those comparisons. But now because um, they are with the same driver and there's, a, there's other uh, sort of correlating factors, you want to remove those in a sense by having the paired data and doing a difference uh, perhaps directly um, as opposed to doing it on the aggregate data that you might have down here. Okay, There's more uh, discussion about what happens when you have strong correlation as we do here, what the implication is uh, for whether you should do the, a two sample test or whether you should do the paired test. That discussion is included in Montgomery and Runger and I strongly encourage that you take a look at that um, and, and look at those various scenarios.